Whether you have a skin interest, a skin query, a skin trauma, or skin disease, I warmly welcome you to Heal Thy Skin, a podcast brought to you by Derm Health Co. I'm Marnie, dermal clinician, dermoscopist, and your podcast host. Skin is deeper than beauty, and our mission is to build the largest platform of specialized practitioners focused on skin health and skin empowerment. Join me each week where we go deep into the skin and beyond to hear stories and education from leading practitioners on a journey of skin health. This episode is proudly brought to you by Derm Health Co. Events. At the start of 2020, we had four live events lined up, ready to go, all planned, caterers on call, and then we had to cancel them. But we did not stop there. Over the last few months, we have hosted three virtual skin summits and over the course of the next 12 months we have seven all on different topics the first one we covered was the foundations of skin health the second was gut and skin health and the third was covering psoriasis and eczema and these are all available online for you to either join in if you can live and hear from expert speakers hear about stories from those with lived experience and if you're not available to listen on the day whether you have work or whether you're in a completely different time zone that's completely okay everything is recorded and everything is put on a portal in our website that you can watch on repeat whenever you want from wherever you want in your pjs i don't care Uh, and this is all available through the Derm Health Co website. If you have a look at events, you can sign up to individual events. You can sign up to a few. And we're really proud of this because it's just another way that we can support you on your skin health journey and highlight some of these providers and these people with lived experience to share their stories so that you don't feel so isolated, so that we can bring you some evidence-based information and so that we can t- continue to grow the Derm Health Co community. So head over to www.dermhealth.co. Hello, welcome to the Heal Thy Skin podcast. I'm Marnie, your host, and today I'm speaking with plastic surgeon, Dr. Simone Matusek. When you think of plastic surgery, do you often think of synthetic implants or injectables? Have you heard of fat grafting? With advances constantly being made in surgical and minimally invasive techniques and technology, many procedures are becoming more accessible, not to mention safer, with significantly shorter recovery times. And while plastic surgery is widespread and common, it still doesn't mean that undergoing or choosing a procedure is as simple as showing up in your surgeon's office on the day of the surgery. There are still lots of do's and don'ts to consider throughout the entire process, and it is important to do your homework beforehand. Dr. Simone is a fully qualified plastic reconstructive and cosmetic surgeon, and she was one of the first surgeons to be offering this technique of fat grafting in Australia. She travelled internationally and extensively to gain this experience and has since developed her own effective fat grafting technique. Her practice philosophy is to leave patients looking refreshed and rejuvenated, not radically different. And the aim of plastic surgery treatments is to provide just subtle enhancements of a person's features to restore their anatomy that has changed due to the process of aging or disease. So I look forward to bringing this episode to you. I started by asking uh, Dr. Simone what she thought was the biggest misconception in plastic surgery. Oh, a few things. Firstly, that it can fix everything and that everyone can benefit. I mean, 
some people and some faces, some bodies are honestly just better left alone. The risk of touching them uh, outweighs the potential benefits. I think we see that with a lot of celebrities now starting to have cosmetic procedures very young that they simply don't need and possibly are detracting from their attractiveness currently and in the future with the consequences of what they're doing. And also the other thing is that because of quite a large portion of the work we now see wandering around is quite obvious, does not look at all natural in some cases. People actually come to me fearing that coming for a plastic or cosmetic procedure is going to make them look done. Often the first thing someone will tell me is, I want to fix this. I don't like the fact that I'm aging or looking older, but I also really don't want to look done. That's the overwhelming message I'm getting these days in consultations. Hmm. And am I right to say that if it is done right, you will walk past someone and not even realise that they've had work done? Absolutely. That's really the way it should be. I always say the secret to, to good plastic surgery is looking like you haven't had it. I mean, of course, there are people that have made a career of looking unusual with their procedures, kind of famous based on the fact that they have done extremes to their body. Some would argue that it's their own choice. Others would say that perhaps, you know, they're a little psychologically disturbed. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, they're an extreme example. However, even people coming for something very small, injecting, for example, I often say to people, bad injecting can look much more obvious than well done surgery people do assume there's a non-surgical fix for everything but sometimes it is just a case of committing to surgery because there is no non-surgical alternative and you know there's the assumption that all the really extreme or bad work out there is in fact surgery particularly to the face but sometimes it can just be years of just overfilling and bad injections that can give that appearance and no surgery's been done at all so Mm. So tell us about your career and how you got to do the work that you're doing today. Uh, So I started off doing my internship. That's the first year you let out into the wild after six years of medical school at RPA. And uh, I had always known I wanted to do some form of surgery. The medical specialties never really, I have to say, inspired me as much. I spent a lot of the last three years of my medical student life in operating theatres. I did an elective term both in neurosurgery and plastic surgery. So I was always tossing up between the two. And then during my intern year, I was exposed to neurosurgery. I did enjoy it, but I then decided to move to the United Kingdom for 18 months and work as a resident over there in plastic surgery to give that a try. And after the first few months there, I realised I was more interested in plastic surgery, mainly because it is one of the few specialties that you are able to operate all over the body. And each procedure is somewhat more tailored than others. I mean, every surgery needs to be planned individually to some extent, according to individual patients, but plastic surgery even more so. People's skin and their tissue makeup vary so different. It's, you know, people always say it's a more artistic specialty I've always liked artistic pursuits in my life I did them in high school and try to continue some to find some time to do them so it was kind of the perfect mix of that for me so I finally decided to do that and after my time in the United Kingdom I was going to train there but I couldn't handle eight months of winter so I moved back here I did another year of residency and then did one year of compulsory general surgery which means operating on bowel and mainly an emergencies like appendicitis for one year and then got onto the plastic surgery training scheme it's a four-year program and so after completing that there's two exams involved in that and various rotations through different hospitals I then did some post-training fellowships in my areas of interest. So the year after I finished, I worked in Melbourne with a variety of breast surgeons and also got involved in some research at the time. I started to do some anatomic dissections at the University of Melbourne and found some interesting discoveries about the crease under the breast, it's known as the inframammary fold, and also the crease under the bum. So Legitimately, I do have a PhD. I joke in tits and bums. It's a bit more serious than that, obviously. But I did, during that time, work out what causes the crease, what are its attachments and the sorts of things that can impact it. So obviously, it's very relevant to breast surgery, the tightness or how defined the breast crease is 
does impact how you perform surgeries, whether it's fat grafting or implants or reconstruction. And the same goes for the butter crease as well. It can be impacted or disturbed by procedures such as liposuction in the area. So it's important to be aware of which bits of it to avoid and not. So that's essentially what my research did. So I did that at the same time as doing practical surgery. And then subsequently I spent the following year in the United States working with fat grafting experts. I had read about fat transfer in my training towards the end of it, it was just starting to have a resurgence in the United States. There are people in the world that have been doing it a lot longer than we have here in Europe and America. There are surgeons that have been doing it for longer than 20 years. Whilst plastic surgeons have always done fat grafting, which is transferring fat from one area of the body to another, it was typically only done in small volumes. People had tried to graft larger volumes, but due to poorer techniques, there was quite a high complication rate of the fat not taking and getting hard and lumpy. So for a time, it was sort of put on the back burner. Not many people were doing it. And then a landmark article was published by a surgeon in New York uh, when I was in the third year of my training and he showed simply spectacular results and no one in Australia was doing it at the time. In fact, people were saying at the time, oh my goodness, it's ridiculous. This is having a resurgence. It's going to cause problems. And I just sat there quietly and looked at the article and thought, I really want to learn this. So I went along to the United States and worked with two people that did a lot of it sort of combine their techniques and things I've refined over the years. And I've been doing fat grafting since late 2010, early 2011. And it has now started to gain more popularity amongst other surgeons in Australia, uh, breast surgeons for reconstructive purposes after breast cancer and also for cosmetic reasons. People are starting to do it a little bit more, which is good because early on, fortunately, there was a lot of fear around the procedure. I was one of the few people doing it. And obviously, when a procedure is new, and rightly so, people are a little bit suspicious or apprehensive about it. And then finally, before setting up my practice, I did spend some time with a facial surgeon in London for three months doing another fellowship. So fellowship is just where you go and work with someone of choice uh, side by side and learn their techniques in a specific area. And I've been in practice in Sydney since then. My practice is based in Potts Point in Sydney. I live quite close to my practice, which is the way I like it. I try to keep it small and simple. I operate nearby, just makes for a better, more balanced lifestyle. Absolutely. And what a wonderful journey. So I'd like to hear about this crease. So is the idea that with certain liposuction and other procedures, if done incorrectly, that it removes the crease? Is that what? Uh, Well, there's a few things. So the breast crease can vastly vary in people presenting for breast surgery. So Any type of crease could be problematic. There's the very light or not very well-defined crease. So the risk of that one is if you go and put a very large, heavy implant without reconstructing that crease or properly attaching it along the lengths of its attachments, which is often to bone, and redefining that crease, then the implant can migrate down onto the abdominal area. I mean, it's not going to end up in your lap, but (laughs) it is it's going to end up a few centimetres down and that's sort of what we call technically bottoming out, which is exactly as it describes, that implant can end up sitting below the native crease. So you end up with two creases. So that's one potential problem. The other potential problem that is seen a lot with congenital breast problems is where the crease is extremely tight and also the tissues between the nipple and the crease. So they have a shortened distance between the crease and the nipple areola complex. And that is quite difficult to release depending on the degree of tightness. That's due to a congenital band of tissue called fascia or without grossing people out, like the gristle between meat that you see. Imagine that's what fascia is like. It's a fairly stiff and pliable layer and it can spring back like an elastic band even when it is released. And particularly for people with these tight creases and tight areas of the breast, uh, I've found that fat grafting releases it better and prevents it knitting back together and springing back. 
So in fact, in people with those sorts of crease problems, fat grafting can correct them better than just using implants, which the crease can then spring back and again, create a band across the implant sometimes above it. And that's called a double bubble, exactly what it is, which is across the implant and underneath it. So these little discoveries about the crease and its attachments and where these bands of tight tissue are assisted with the process of either reconstructing the crease or needing to release it. So that's the one in the breast. The buttock one, there is a pocket of fat that people typically don't like under their buttock crease. It has been nicely referred to in the plastic surgery literature as the banana fold. Uh, not a very nice name, but no, not at all. I wonder who coins these terms. I'd love to say that it's males that don't have the banana fold. but So imagine it is actually like a, a banana sitting under the crease, a roll of tissue. And if that is excessively liposucked, what does happen is the whole upper buttock crease can fall down and the buttock can feel heavy, it can feel like it's dropped. So people are aware of that sensation as well as visually they have multiple creases across the back of the thigh and the buttock can look like it's sagging. So I have had to fat graft those particular areas in people that have had liposuction elsewhere that's been overdone. So when people say present with that pocket of fat to me, I just, unfortunately, the group of patients, you have to say, well, the risk of trying to remove that pocket outweighs the benefit, you know, of removing it. Yes, unfortunately, you have a role there that doesn't look great, but there is a worse consequence of your entire buttock sagging. So, How interesting. So you are known as Australia's leading fat grafting expert. You spoke about some of the applications and a little bit about what it is, but are you able to explain a little bit further? What is fat grafting? What is it Mm -hmm. used for? So pretty much if you think of in plastic surgery, there are other types of grafts than fat. Um, There are skin grafts as well. A graft basically refers to an area of tissue that once removed, it's actually dead. Once it's, and it's transferred, it's actually dead. And it relies on the blood supply of the new area to live again. So there is a process of take of the graft after it's been removed. So, and fat can pretty much be removed from anywhere in the body where there is excess. It is usually spun with a centrifuge to remove excess blood and oil to purify the fat. And then it is injected after that process. And then over the coming days to weeks, it relies on the blood supply of the tissue for take. So therefore there are multiple factors involved in fat graft take, which is why it does not always take predictably or equally in every single person. So for example, if someone starts with a very small breast and a very tight breast, think of it, there's not a lot of space or tissue to graft to. So there is only so much fat that can be placed in that type of breast. Conversely, if you have a very large or and loose breast, there is much more of a potential to place a larger volume fat graft. And obviously it is dependent on people having both the right breast makeup, but also enough fat. And there are people that are simply too slender for a fat graft of the breast to give them any significant enhancement. Most people would have enough for a small amount to, sometimes it is an advantage in certain people to add a fat graft to an implant, either to reduce visibility, address any asymmetry of the breasts, or address those tight creases that I mentioned. And in those people, you do not need quite as much fat as in a full large volume breast fat graft. Of course, fat doesn't just go in the breast the as it's called brazilian butt lift is very well known obviously as another site where fat is injected can also be used for much smaller areas small depressions after trauma Uh, i've put it into people's legs into areas of the body where they've lost tissue and in the face it can also be used as an alternative to fillers or for reconstruction again with areas of tissue loss or for congenital reasons people have asymmetry so it can be used for a wide variety of reconstructive purposes and for cosmetic reasons how interesting and what are some of the risks of fat grafting and how do they differ to perhaps traditional implants 
So I say to people, no procedures without risk. And you kind of have to weigh up the risks and benefits of either implants or fat grafting and decide which one's right for you. That's a decision I can't make for people. Often there are people that may be suitable for both. So it's a number of factors I, I say should play in their decision making. Firstly, there is a group that come and they are simply just too thin to get any reasonable result. I do not like to liposuction areas, particularly the thighs in slender people. If you have a perfectly smooth, slender thigh, trying to disrupt that with liposuction can lead to rippling, dimpling and complications. In exchange for a small change in the breast to me is not worth it. So fortunately, there is a group I say, commit to implants or leave it alone. I can't, there's no fat to harvest. Then there are people that, if there's a definite diet-resistant pocket of fat, and I mean, even some slender people have it, often there is a pocket on the outer thigh, the love handle area, or even arms in some people, they just have one area that will not budge. That I feel is a good candidate for fat grafting because they have an area that bothers them. So even if their take rate is not exactly as they hoped, they will always get some improvement in the breasts, but also in the liposuction site as well. And also people have to consider further surgeries down the track. Once you have implants, typically most people get used to the look and it's unusual except maybe 30, 40 years later for them to say, right, I want to have no implants at all. And most of those patients are now coming to me saying that they at least want some form of fat grafting to restore the volume. So once you commit to implants, it is very unlikely going to be your last operation. And the lifespan of implants is about 10 years. Saying that I have patients who have implants that look just fine at 20 years. Other patients can have issues with them as early as two to three years if they're unlucky enough to be a small percentage that gets hardening or capsular contracture, which is one of the major side effects of having a breast augmentation. If it does happen, typically does need reoperation. And with each operation, the risk of hardening or that abnormal scar tissue forming around the implant does increase. Each subsequent breast augmentation with implants does end up taking a little bit of tissue as well and thinning out the covering. So all these are things to consider. And look, I still do a lot of implants in my practice as well. There are simply people that either want a definite large volume increase. So fat grafting is not typically going to give you a very large increase, like a two, three cup size increase in one surgery it would require multiple sessions, which can then end up being quite expensive. So they're things to, to consider. How big do you want to be? Do you have liposuction sites that you would consider addressing anyway if you do want to be significantly bigger is more than one procedure not out of the question i have had people have two three even four fat graftings and go from an a to a d cup it is possible but you're not going to get that changed particularly with a very tight uh, constricted breast like the ones i described with one surgery and again, here's where you have to weigh up the short and long-term costs. Yes, a breast augmentation with implants, it's a much shorter procedure. So most cosmetic surgery in terms of its cost is time-based. So it is initially going to be more expensive because the liposuction, the harvesting, the handling of the fat to do it properly and the injecting is much more time-consuming. So the initial cost of a fat graft may be greater. You also have to weigh up the long-term costs of revision breast surgery a primary breast augmentation usually takes one to one and a half hours if it is straightforward. A revision breast augmentation, meaning taking out the implants and putting new ones in, can take anywhere from three hours up. So all these things are considerations when signing up for surgery. A lot of people that come back who have problems with their implants, unfortunately, say, well, I never knew this when I was 18 years old that I would have all these problems. Um, what are the potential consequences of fat grafting? Well, when we first started to do it, there was a lot of concern it was going to cause imaging issues for breast cancer. So that means when people present for their screening mammograms that perhaps the areas of fat that have not taken so well, which is called fat necrosis, where parts of the fat die, that that can create changes or calcium deposition, which can mimic a breast cancer. Radiologists 
getting much more used to fat grafting. It is more common. The kind of changes I just described can occur with any breast procedure, breast lifting, breast reduction can trigger those sorts of changes. So it's kind of been accepted that it should not be a problem with screening. I screen all my patients before surgery with an MRI, which is a highly specific breast test and a mammogram or ultrasound. So if the fat grafting does create any changes in the future, they can be compared. Obviously one in eight to nine women still will develop a breast cancer. So if lumps or other problems do occur after fat grafting, it is usually a case of screening those realizing that they're due to the fat and kind of putting them in a box unless they change. So that is the potential side effect of fat grafting. If it does form small lumps, they need to be investigated. It does not typically form large hard lumps throughout the breast. It is usually a few discrete areas if it does occur in a percentage, I would say around 15%. But I say to people, you have to weigh up having a scan and a small biopsy as an outpatient versus three-hour revisions every 10 years. So no procedure is perfect and without consequence. Mm, how very interesting. And you mentioned that there is increased time for the procedure yes. of fat grafting. So is it typically done in one day or is it done over oh, a yes. series of time? Yeah. Most fat grafts, and it, this is entirely dependent on how many liposuction sites people choose, will go from anywhere from three to four hours. People have extra liposuction sites. It can take even longer. The thing is with liposuction, it's possible to speed it up depending on the width of the cannula that is used, which is the instrument used to harvest it. Obviously, a wider cannula harvests the fat faster, but a bigger instrument obviously can lead to more depressions. So it's therefore using a small cannula leads to much a much smaller risk complications with the liposuction but it is also more time consuming then the same goes with injecting the fat and this is where the problems arose when the procedure was done many years ago people used to just stick giant lumps of fat in to areas it has to be done in what are called micro grafts and that means just putting a few mils in every area of the breast in a 3d arrangement so the fat grafting does take a significant amount of time to be done properly sure you could rush it but that is going to lead to lumps fat necrosis and poor take so it is about pretty much you've got to think every fat cell needs another one adjacent to it or another tissue cell that's living to survive which is why it requires so much extra time than breast augmentation with implants Yes, I see. And what happens if someone then loses weight after the surgery? Will they then lose all that fat that has been grafted? Yes. So it is best to be at your target weight or even slightly lighter coming to surgery because then if there is any weight gain post-surgery, it is going to, you know, the breast is going to grow. Typically, it will behave like fat in the grafted area. So anecdotally, I find diet-resistant pockets of fat do respond in terms of take. For example, I mean, there are pockets on the outer thigh in women, sometimes the diet-resistant pocket, diet pockets over the triceps. There are often areas, particularly the thigh fat, does have some hormonal influences. You do not often see that pattern in men when they gain weight. And it is those sorts of areas I've found have a better than average take rate. This is anecdotal, though. Most of the scientific literature suggests that no particular site in the body is better or worse. But, I mean, we still need to do a lot more research in proving fat graft take. I've been doing it for 10 years. Most people's take rates, when you look around the world, comparatively are between 60 to 70%. There are things, uh, there's a device, a pre-expansion device, which can potentially give you an extra 10% in some cases, but that requires preoperative preparation and doesn't necessarily give that effect in everyone. So most of the time, 60 to 70% would be a good range or, and in some papers would suggest the high 60% range is the average for fat grafters around the world. So hopefully at some point we'll be able to consistently improve that to being a little bit better. And you have been doing this for about a decade now. I'd love to hear about a favourite career moment, maybe a time you got wonderful results for your patient that reminded you of doing what you do or a research kind of career highlight. 
Well, I really like, I mean, where I think fat grafting has a, should have a very big role in the future is in correcting congenital breast asymmetry. So there are girls that go through their high school years, you know, with breasts that can vary two, three cup sizes difference. And the approach to those, I mean, typically we do say under 18, you know, really don't really do cosmetic surgery, but in those cases, typically what has been done in such extreme asymmetries, which can be psychologically distressing, is that a breast tissue expander is placed, which is gradually injected with saline, expanded to match the other breast, and then uh, the patient will subsequently have implants placed, usually once they reach 18 years of age. Now, I did do one of my earliest fat grafting patients was a girl who was 17 when she came for her first fat graft she had a similar problem where there was a huge difference in cup sizes of one side and I did two fat grafts in her and released the constriction band that I talked about so there are people I think if you release the constriction band before they finish their growth phase of the breast potentially the breast could also grow a little bit more on its own normally so imagine that this constriction band varies in how severe it is sometimes it is like a 3d circular ring that encases the glandular tissue and it simply can't expand in some girls and they're the sort of patient if you look at them they literally have no breast development sometimes it's on both sides and more often than not it is asymmetric sometimes one breast is extremely tight and it hasn't expanded the other side can be extremely different permutations and combinations of how that condition can manifest uh, it's called a tuberous breast and the breasts are often a abnormal shape as well as a result of the constriction. And the constriction can occur in different parts of the breast. It can be all four quadrants or just the bottom. And releasing those areas of constriction can potentially allow the glandular tissue to grow on its own. And unfortunately, I mean, a lot of people don't present early to me. They present sometimes, you know, once they're past their growth phase of the breast and I did have the opportunity to do this girl's just the tail end of her growth phase and she got an excellent result and I think part of that was due to releasing the constriction band early so I think there is good potential now that we know the safety of fat grafting it's relatively something non-invasive you could do in someone that is a teenager because pretty much once you place and expand into them, you have committed them to a scar, at least there for their life, five centimetre scar and implants. Usually when you place an implant in one side, there are cases where you can just place one in the smaller side, but an implant sits higher and in a breast that is already tighter, it often does create an asymmetry that requires an implant in the other side. So you often, with a breast asymmetry, not only commit someone to one implant for a lifetime but also a second implant i shouldn't necessarily say a lifetime because obviously these people can have them taken out and have fat grafting which a lot of people come to me to do but be a lot simpler if their smaller breasts had just been addressed in their teenage years and that was it for them and how wonderful what a great example of prevention before cure as well just mm -hmm. a, a different mm -hmm. perspective on and how that can be used so what are some of the changes that maybe you'd like to see in the future or that you think are on the horizon for fat grafting? Well, there has been talk that there will hopefully be a Medicare item number for these patients that have congenital breast asymmetry or have had breast cancer. At the moment, there is no Medicare item number. Australia is extremely behind in this. Europe and America have cover for fat grafting and health insurance cover for these sorts of reasons. Obviously, it's not suitable to have cover for cosmetic reasons, which is what people always fear when an item number is introduced that it will be abused. Uh, there was recently an article in the media about that and I feel that was exaggerated. I mean, there are strict criteria to qualify for an item number where required to take photos and medical notes. And I think, you know, if you look at the long-term costs of starting someone on an expanded implant pathway, at the age, you know, in their mid to late teens till they're 80 compared to a few fat graphs in their life. Like obviously people will fluctuate in weight, they have pregnancies, they may need more than one procedure, but 
it is a much simpler procedure. It's using our own tissue. It's got less scarring, a lower downtime. You know, these are our considerations. So that's, you know, what I would like to see. And obviously some advances would be nice in definitively improving fat graft take and perhaps being able to multiply people's fat outside the body to help those that don't have enough of their own fat. People are always saying, oh, can't I donate fat to someone else? Uh, that's not possible. You need to be genetically identical. Interestingly, one of the people that I trained in fat grafting with America found some triplets and two of them had love handles and breasts and one was born without breasts and no body fat was from the slightly chubby triplets and reconstructed the two breasts or gave the thinner, flatter chested triplet breasts from her sisters. So extremely unusual case, but very yeah, interesting. What a case study. How interesting. No, he's presented it at meetings, but it's a great result. But apart from genetically identical rare cases like that, uh, I do not foresee people being able to donate their fat in the future. There are some people that claim you can freeze fat. I mean, at the moment, we're struggling to get, you know, take rates above 70%. Freezing the fat would certainly reduce that further. And, you know, it's not recommended or mainstream. Some devices have been tried, stem cell augmentation devices. Again, they're not mainstream. They have been tested and in some studies have been shown to increase take. But, you know, there always has to be the risk weighed up with uh, adding stem cells because they could potentially have a cancer trigger if excess stem cells are added. Naturally, centrifuging does concentrate the population of stem cells. So it's believed that that is enough at this stage until there is further research into the stem cell devices. The other thing I'd like to see is improvement in skin tightening devices because that's the other challenge with fat grafting is in some people with poor skin quality, liposuction can cause dimpling or rippling or, or loose skin. And they can often, people like that can also just like the very thin people be unsuitable for large volumes of liposuction because in order to gain volume in the breast, you don't want to be creating a problem in another area. And better skin tightening devices would allow, I guess, to push more boundaries with liposuction because that still limits how much can be taken from any area. There is currently a skin tightening liposuction device available called a VASA. So that heats the tissues, which leads to increased skin retraction and tightening in people that are high risk. I do use that device in some people after I've harvested the fat. I don't believe you can heat the fat and get survival rates as good. So that is an extra step in some procedures in people that can benefit from extra skin tightening, such as people who've had multiple pregnancies, might have a bit of loose skin on their stomach. It's not bad enough for a tummy tuck, but it could be improved with that. There are laser liposuction devices, which uh, deliver even more heat. They are not mainstream in Australia. They are used a lot in Brazil. They do show some spectacular before and afters with them. They definitely do have a greater effect on skin tightening. It's just the technology both in America and in Australia has not been extensively safety tested. There are concerns about obviously the more you heat the skin, the greater the risk of burns and other things. But it would also be nice to see improvements in non-surgical skin tightening devices. There are a lot on the market. We've got great devices to tighten the skin of the face. Lasers, that sort of thing, um, you know, have a very definite effect on skin tightening. Sure, you can laser the body, but it's a long and painful and expensive process. Uh, and it's usually actually the deeper tissues that need tightening, not just the surface skin layer. So, you know, potentially it would be nice to see something have a real impact on tightening skin and the deeper tissue layers of the body. And I would like to just touch on that a little bit further. I mean, traditionally as a plastic surgeon, you're doing surgery, whether it be reconstructive or cosmetic in nature, but you're also really passionate about skincare. Uh, and something that is sometimes forgotten, I think, maybe for patients or maybe, uh, I don't know, certain plastic surgeons might not come from a route of skincare and topical skincare, but 
it is so important, right? If someone is having some kind of aesthetic procedure on their face, that their skin quality is good because there's no point having a really tight face if you've got all this dyschromia and pigmentation, etc. So you've actually released your own range. Tell us about why you decided to do this and yeah, tell us a little bit more about the formulations and how you're using it in your practice. Yeah. So I started researching product development over 10 years ago. I mean, I've been using aggressive skincare on my face since my mid twenties. I remember in the dermatology lecture, them showing run after biopsies of the skin using vitamin A um, and how it thickens the collagen layer. So I promptly placed myself on vitamin A then and there and never stopped. And I think, you know, there are certain things surgery cannot fix. I always like to say you cannot fix your skin with a scalpel. You're right, you can tighten it, but you never find lines, uh, the loss of elasticity, the dyschromia. If you do not do something to keep collagen synthesis uh, going and also manage any pigmentation or in inflammatory redness issues. They have actually interestingly done studies comparing volumizing a face versus improving skin texture and tone. And they did definitively find people that improving your skin texture and tone has a much greater effect on creating a youthful appearance than just volumization. And I'm not saying volumization shouldn't be done, you know, absolutely. Once people start to get into their mid to late thirties or with massive weight loss, volume replacement is part and parcel of, you know, staying looking young, but it is also maintaining what is above that that is so important. So I always say, you know, skincare is the first step to be doing and everyone should really be doing it from you know their twenties up until you stop caring what your skin looks like. And it is so important not only to use skincare, but to do it regularly. It's not like some can't decide to have a face mask extreme weekend where you just plaster your face for 48 hours with every product under the sun. You kind of, it's something you have to like exercise. It's a, you know, a daily commitment, a little bit of time every day to put um, concentrated active ingredients that have been proven to have a real effect on the skin Things you're looking to do with these ingredients trigger collagen synthesis. It's pretty much all bad news from the mid teens. You know, collagen synthesis declines only a little bit from that time. But once the early 30s hit, you have decreased repair mechanisms. So, environmental exposure, sun exposure, it does hit your skin harder than uh, when you were younger. So, there's something you can do daily that's simple, effective and safe, like skincare to trigger collagen synthesis, then you know, why not do that? That is definitely, for me, the first step. And then things like light treatments, broadband light, lasers and fillers and injectables are the next step after that. So um, my skincare range, I started with 10 years ago doing product development, the first Kind of product I really got excited about was were a few peptides I was looking at that uh, produced in uh, in Europe and they you know have an effect in the right concentration and that can work like an injectable. The particular one in my ring clays night cream does work on the same pathway as botulinum toxin. It's just one of the ingredients um, in ring clays night and it inhibits the muscle contraction pathway. Obviously, I mean, it is in a high concentration in the cream. It is not equivalent to an injection, but if you do use it regularly within three to four weeks, most people will notice a very significant change in, in the fine lines. It also, the Rinclair's Night Complex contains peptides that trigger new collagen synthesis. They also stabilize collagen synthesis. It's quite, as we get older, collagen formation not only reduces it also becomes disorganized so it stabilizes formation and helps continuously be forming new collagen and then the day cream is designed to be protective and also hydrating uh, it contains hyaluronic acid and not all hyaluronic acid is created equal there are low and high molecular weights and having a, the correct mix of those means that some of it penetrates deep 
and the remainder can remain on the surface to fill the lines. So it gives a visible improvement in the lines as well as targeting and hydrating the deeper layers. And it also contains concentrated niacinamide or B3, which is a well-known ingredient for being protective against oxidative damage, reduces inflammation, all that. So they were my first two products I released. Then subsequently, I worked on a facial oil with three different types of highly stable vitamin C and astaxanthin. Astaxanthin is a relatively new, uh, it's considered a super antioxidant because it does have several thousand times the effect even of concentrated vitamin Cs uh, in some studies and that is delivered in a hydrating facial oil. People do assume that facial oil can cause breakouts in people that are very acne prone. Yes, it can, but most people actually tolerate oil do not necessarily lead to breakouts. And combined with that, then I subsequently released a cleanser. Uh, the cleanser is an exfoliating cleanser. There's a lot of myths about exfoliation that it can only be done a few times a week or very sparingly. That's sort of quite old thinking. It does entirely depend on the skin type. And exfoliation is part of increasing your natural cell turnover, just removing dead skin cells. There are skin types that cannot tolerate daily exfoliation that are very dry. Also people that might be using other exfoliating agents like vitamin A can struggle with using it every day. But I've found the balance of uh, face fruit punch, which is the cleanser I created, is in the vast majority tolerated daily or at the very least second daily has a mix of alpha hydroxy acids that are fruit derived. They are another well-known skin ingredient that not only increase cell turnover, but also reduce pigmentation and fine lines. I do have a couple of other products in the pipeline that will be released over the next few months. So stay tuned. And also amongst those, I have a lip product because the lips are often sort of forgotten. You can't typically rub most facial products onto the lips because they'll end up too dry and irritated. So I actually, my formulator gave me a sample of this, this lip product and I wasn't a great believer in something that could increase the size of the lips, but I thought, look, I'll, I'll give it a try. And sure enough, I have to say the week I used it consistently, two of my patients accused me of having lip filler. I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> and I certainly, uh, jokes aside, I wouldn't say to people, you will get the results of lip filler again with a cream, but it does definitely hydrate, plump and collagen, synthesize, uh, create that in, in the lips. And then I started working on my formulator with one with all those same ingredients, but a bit of chili. And as you probably know, with chili, you eat it, your lips can turn quite red and big. So that was, we tested all sorts of concentrations and sort of ended up on one that does create a little bit of irritation or a buzz in the lips for maybe you know, 10, 15 minutes after application and was not too annoying. You know, in the future, I may release a slightly higher dose of chili if, if there is a, a call for it. So that's kind of how the range developed. I wanted something that wasn't too complicated. So people looking for something simple, you know, they can use the cleanser, the day night cream and supplement that with the facial oil for extra hydration of course i'm not saying that's a cure-all for people with you know skin conditions they may need to use other things but for the vast majority of people looking for something they can use simply from anti-aging that was kind of the purpose behind it a lot of people have a cabinet just full of stuff that they don't use i always say to people buy only what you're going to use regularly and one of the well the only lip balm with chili that i've heard of i love it <laughs> Yeah, it took a while to convince my formulator to do it. It was worrying. We tested it for a while, but, you know, it seems to work well. That's more, the lip tea's hot is for um, when you go out for regular hydration. I suggest just the lip tea's uh, standard. Yes, yes, good advice. So what would you say to someone, and I, getting back to like the, the plastic surgery side and just you being a consultant plastic surgeon and of course with all your vast experience what would you say would be some red flags during a consultation if someone is looking to undergo some kind of cosmetic procedure whether it be surgical or uh, non-surgical so always when people bring me airbrushed instagram 
photos is the concern saying that they want to look like that. I try to present the ugly truth in harsh lighting before and after, you know, it, a lot of photography can, you know, trick people. There's a lot, you know, you look at some of the, there's a lot of accounts actually, you know, Instagram just dedicated simply to showing how photography, the Brazilian butt lift is a classic where people, you know, pull their underwear up, stick their backside out, take it in a flattering light and look completely different than if they're standing relaxed in a down light. So, you know, you have to have realistic expectations and, you know, presenting airbrushed photos from one angle where people are clothed, you know, is concerning to me. And people also need to accept that not every person is suitable for every procedure and they're not necessarily going to get, you know, the results that someone with unfortunately a better canvas to work with is, is going to get. It does come down to that. Breast augmentation is one of those things where it can vary vastly. If you have someone that presents with a completely flat chest, double A minus, let's say that's symmetrical, you can pretty much place anything under there in terms of an, an implant and you're going to achieve a reasonable symmetry they also don't have breast tissue that's potentially going to age and sag on top of the implant. So that's sort of a great example. You could put the same implant into 50 different women and it would look completely different. So it is about having reasonable expectations of what can be achieved with your body type. And in some people, for example, very large breasts that may have dropped after childbirth, that is going to require lifting procedures. You know, it is just not, for example, just a matter of, putting an implant under it and achieving the same effect as someone with, with no breast tissue. So if you're going to bring photos, it's important that you bring photos of people that are starting with it before that looks at least somewhat similar. The other thing is people that pick up very small things that, you know, I think cannot really be fixed surgically or have too much risk you know the way people scar genetic lifestyle factors do definitely play a role in the type of result that can be achieved and people need to be aware of that certainly if people present to me overweight for surgery i do recommend weight loss prior to any liposuction or tummy tuck procedure it will vastly give you a better long-term result and you know it's worth waiting for that losing weight gradually means the skin has time to retract. So then what's left for me to mop up with liposuction is truly, for example, only the diet resistant pockets. So, you know, I like people, you know, that can work with me and do the things they need to do to prepare for surgery, get the best results. And, you know, you've got to accept that statistically, you know, about 12% or even more of patients presenting for plastic surgery do have what is called body dysmorphia. Um, and they are a group of patients who simply, no matter what one achieves, are not going to be happy due to psychological reasons. And it's really important to flag those people or screen because the results are not only going to be disappointing for them, but they're also going to be disappointing for the surgeon because, you know, essentially you want to do cosmetic procedures to make people happy, to improve their quality of life. If they have body dysmorphia you're simply not going to do that so no one's a winner in those kind of circumstances mm, that's really good advice and is there any advice that you give to your patients that may be beneficial for listeners as well to perhaps prepare for surgery so i always say uh, particularly any sort of fat grafting liposuction procedure do whatever you can diet and exercise wise to stabilize everything before surgery. Just as I mentioned with fat grafting, if you're going to say, decide to do a triathlon, please do it before your fat grafting procedure, anything that's going to cause major weight or muscle changes, uh, fat muscle ratio changes. It's important to stabilize all that for at least a good three months uh, before surgery. Also, you know, you always have to read through the risks and complications of any surgery carefully and, you know, do not expect an immediate and quick recovery from any major procedure. There's always going to be some form of swelling, scarring in the body, bruising and settling time. And do not 
fear that the thing you wake up with is going to be what you're going to have three, six, 12 months later. And depending on the procedure and also genetic factors involved in scarring, there are longer settling times for some people or some procedures than others. But for example, with any major liposuction procedure, I say to people, it's a minimum of three months of swelling. And in the first few weeks, you know, despite the fact I've removed fat, you may not even fit into your normal genes due to swelling for the skin effects, the skin tightening and improvement results of any procedures, liposuction or even a laser. Again, you're waiting three months for your final results. So, you know, you have to sometimes be patient and, you know, to achieve the final results. And that's important because I think a lot of people can get nervous in the weeks following surgery. That's always going to look like that. But typically with time, a lot of things do vastly improve. You have to be prepared that you know, you may be that person that takes a little bit longer to recover, a little bit longer to get back to exercise and your normal life. Good advice for a society that we're so used to just having things immediately. A little patience can go a long way. Yes. So Dr. Simon, where can people find more about you and the work that you're doing? So I have a website, www.drsimonmatusek.com procedures I uh, do are listed there, a bit about myself, how to make appointments and information both about non-surgical and surgical procedures. I also have an Instagram where I sort of update a little anecdotes about plastic surgery. I show some freaky celebrity before and afters and a bit of a mix, some plastic surgery history and also more recent results. I try all the before and afters on my website. I try to sort of make them long-term results at six to 12 months that are fully settled. On my Instagram page, uh, the handle is at Dr. Simon Plastic Surgeon Sydney. You do see more recent results, a few little videos of me in action. And then my skincare site is skintillation.com and the products, there's information about each product and they can be ordered and they ship worldwide. So they're, my, they're the main areas to find out about me. Wonderful. And if people are interested in procedures and they're not sure if they're suitable, they can always email the practice. We have not so much now with COVID, but a lot of patients do travel for the back grafting. I always say it's worthwhile touching base. We are happy to assess people based on photos if they are suitable prior to needing to commit to a, a, a consultation. So... Mm, wonderful well thank you so much for spending your day with us and mm -hmm. talking more about fat grafting a really interesting mm -hmm. and another unique offering all right thank you for having me on pleasure. your podcast pleasure What a fabulous interview. I loved hearing about Dr. Simone's experience in the plastic and reconstructive world and the three deeper than skin insights that stood out to me were number one, fat grafting. How incredible. And just to think that autologous implants like taking um, fat from different areas of your body and planting it in other areas generally has a better take rate so it's not going to have that same implant rejection that sometimes can occur for someone if they're having um, implants made of silicon etc and also the application for it so not only can it be used by itself but it can also be used when implants are also used take for example a breast augmentation or reconstructive surgery to ensure that it looks more even um, and to fill areas that may not be able to be filled with implants incredible i'm looking forward to seeing how this is used in different techniques and things in the next decade or so Number two, we have discussed this a little bit before in some previous episodes, but just the importance of consultations and making sure that you feel really comfortable with the surgeon and also you've been able to outweigh the risks because what is going to be good for one person isn't necessarily going to suit someone else. Uh, so it is important that even with something that's with fat grafting that may be seen as less invasive, it still is uh, a, a serious 
undertaking and it's important that you also consider that that it is still a, a medical treatment and there are still risks involved so always weigh this up and number three um, it was so fun talking about Dr. Simone's skincare. And often when someone is working, you know, under the skin as such with a plastic sur surgeon, they're not necessarily thinking about how the skin looks on the outside. And Dr. Simone certainly has made this relationship really clear that you don't want to just do a facelift on someone, but then their skin can be in a really poor condition. It's really important to also look after what is being seen on the outside world as well so that is just a little note that yes skincare just certainly does have its place and plastic surgery can't fix everything thank you for joining us for another episode of the heal thy skin podcast if you loved listening to this i would love for you to share it so just pull up that phone put in the copy link send it to a friend family member someone that you think uh, may benefit from listening and take a snap while you're listening to this. Tag us on social media at dermhealth.co. I'll be seeing you next week for another episode of the Heal Thy Skin podcast. Until then, be skin powered.